are being victimized, sometimes sold for as little as $200. Today, I escaped North Korea. North Korea is easily one of the scariest countries in the world. For one, the fact that not so much is known about the country makes it such an enigma that many people just automatically feel weirded out by it. They have no freedom of speaking out what they feel. So. One of the reasons for North Korea's status has been its leader, Kim Jong-un. The dictator has ruled North Korea since 2011, and he's done so with a brutal iron fist. From his opposition to his own people, everyone in North Korea has felt the brutal hand of Kim Jong-un in some way or the other. Nevertheless, some interesting facts about Kim have also recently been revealed. And let me tell you, these facts are as salacious as they are scandalous. Join us in this video as we expose a side of North Korea's dictator that you haven't seen before. The Hermit Kingdom. There is a lot of mystique that generally surrounds North Korea. And to be honest, you can kind of understand why. The country is so secluded from the world that even the facts that are known about it can still be argued. Interestingly, North Korea's seclusion doesn't just affect the people outside the country. As it turns out, many everyday people in North Korea are also blocked from the world. They don't have access to the internet, and as a result, they really don't know what it's like outside the walls of their own country. Nevertheless, there have been some people brave enough in the past who have sought to gain their freedom from the ruthless dictatorship of the Kim dynasty through whichever means necessary. Who will fight for us when we are not free? Machines? Animals? I don't know. These people literally put their own lives on the line for their freedom, choosing to risk their lives instead of just staying in their country. One such person is Yeonmi Park. Yeonmi was born in North Korea, and like every other person, she was born into relative poverty. However, in 2007, she made the bold decision to leave her home country, fleeing the oppression and poverty that the government had enforced on herself and her people, and coming to the West to tell the tales of just how life was in this modern-day hermit kingdom. The story of Yeonmi Park. Yeonmi was born in October 1993 in Hyesan, Ryangang, a province of North Korea known to be relatively middle class. However, the region has an interesting geography, as it is bordered to the north by none other than China. In many cases, people trying to escape North Korea do so via China. And if they do, it means they would most likely have to go through this province. Anyways, back to Yeonmi. She was born to a relatively low-income family, with her father being a civil servant who worked at the Hyesan Town Hall as a member of the ruling Workers' Party of Korea. However, because of his residence and its proximity to China, he was said to have supplemented his income by smuggling goods from China into his country. Now, over the years, one of the more interesting things about North Korea has been that the country is so strapped for resources that its citizens can barely afford any food. For one, North Korea chooses to maintain a secluded status from most other countries. Also, due to the crippling effects of economic sanctions, the country's trade relations have also taken a major hit. So some citizens try their best to bring goods like food and supplies from China and sell them to their fellow countrymen on the black market. It can be a very rewarding venture, but... As you can imagine, the consequences of being caught by the central government are more than dire. Anyways, Yeonmi explained during a speech at the Oslo Freedom Forum that she began to get a little bit of orientation about the outside world after seeing a screening of Titanic. Apparently, the movie made her realize as a teen that the North Korean government was nothing more than an oppressive force and that it showed her the true meaning of love. Plus, the movie actually gave her a desire for freedom, a desire that she would hold on to for a long time, life in North Korea. Just as you would imagine, Yeoman was able to witness firsthand the type of poverty and oppression that was rampant in North Korea's society. Despite being the daughter of a civil servant, she explained that her family was poor, and like many people, they had to struggle to even find what to eat on a daily basis. In an episode of the Joe Rogan Experience, Yeoman gave a harrowing account of what life in North Korea was like. And let me tell you, 
It was no picnic. This was just one of the crazy experiences that Yeoman had to go through in North Korea. Can you imagine how difficult it must have been for people to literally move in their own country? I mean, forget traveling to another country or something. In North Korea, it was a chore in itself to move from one province to the other. Honestly, when you hear her give her account of the things she saw in North Korea, it'd be pretty easy to believe that she was lying or something. But truly, as Yeoman herself explained, life in North Korea was no great shakes. It was practically a chore just to make it out alive on a daily basis, and even if you did, you had to live with the knowledge that many thousands of people wouldn't be as lucky as you. This is no way to live, guys. This is just terrible. The Great Escape Eventually, though, Yeoman mustered up the courage to leave North Korea. In 2007, a 13-year-old Yeoman left the country, choosing her own freedom over her homeland. According to her account that was published in The Telegraph in 2014, her father was supposed to be jailed as he had been caught smuggling goods in from China. However, he managed to bribe his way out of his jail term, and the family began planning their escape from North Korea to China. However, Yeoman's sister Unmi left for China early, without notifying the rest of the family. If you know anything about North Korea, it's that the punishment for leaving illegally can be very steep. If the person who leaves isn't caught, the government could easily retaliate by prosecuting their family members instead, with the hope that they eventually come back. Yeoman's family members were immediately scared that they'd be punished for her sister's descent, so her father sent her and her mother away from the country by moving to China with the help of brokers who regularly smuggled North Koreans into the country. Remember that Yeoman and her family lived in a border town, so they were able to get quick passage, crossing the border into Changbai Korean Autonomous County in China's Jilin province on March 30, 2007. Still, to hear Yeoman say it, this wasn't necessarily the smoothest journey. The only reason I escaped was luckily I was living in the border town of North Korea. You know, literally North Korea is the darkest place on earth. We do not have electricity. So I was able to see some electricity coming from China, and that's when I thought, maybe if I go where the lights were, I might be able to find a bottle of rice. But like, there, there's guards with machine guns. They put the highly electrified wire fences, seal the entire border. So the entire country became a concentration camp. But luckily, uh, my sister who escaped left me a note saying, go find this lady, she's gonna help you to escape. So I found the lady and she bribed the guards on the border. I took my mother with me. I told her to come with me to China. So I crossed the, this with one young man and my mother and myself, three of us crossed the frozen river into China. Yeoman and her mother were able to find a Christian shelter that was headed by both Chinese and South Korean missionaries in Qingdao. And due to the city's large ethnic Korean population, they were able to move around while evading the attention of authorities. With the missionaries' help, they fled to South Korea through Mongolia, finally getting a semblance of freedom. While at the Mongolian border, Yeoman claimed that authorities threatened to send her and her mother back to China. But after much pleading, they were allowed in and were placed under house arrest at a detention center in Ulaanbaatar, the capital city of Mongolia. On April 1, 2009, Yeoman and her mother were sent to Ulaanbaatar's Chinggis Khan Airport to be flown to Seoul Incheon International Airport. Several years later, the South Korean National Intelligence Service also informed Yeoman that her sister, Yunmi, had escaped to South Korea via China and Thailand. Fortunately, Yeoman and her mother were able to reunite with Unmi years later. As for her father, no one really knows what happened to him. Yeoman claimed that he had gotten sick at the time they decided to leave North Korea, so he stayed back, knowing that his ailment would only slow them down. However, it remains unclear if, like the rest of the family, he was able to gain his freedom from North Korea. Well, for his own sake, I sure hope he was. Kim Jong-un's Pleasure Squads Now, there is a lot that would still be said about Yeonmi and her revelations. However, one interesting fact that she has especially shed light on has been the pleasure squads that are available to North Korea's supreme leader, Kim Jong-un. Now, for those who might not know, 
Kim Jong-un rules with unquestionable power in North Korea. The man's word is quite literally law, and anything he says goes. Befitting every absolute ruler, Kim has his kinks. And apparently, his pleasure squad is what helps him satisfy his carnal desires. To be honest, Kim's pleasure squad has been something of a legend. It is a hidden practice that speaks volumes about the level of corruption and depravity that is in North Korea, as well as the massive divide that exists between members of the country's ruling class and the poor masses. Known as the Gipeyumjo in North Korea, the government's pleasure squad is a group that dates back to the regime of Kim Il-sung, North Korea's founder and the grandfather of the current supreme leader. However, it was under the reign of Kim Jong-il, the father of Kim Jong-un, that the squad's activities really became prominent. As you can imagine, the job of these ladies was simple, to provide companionship and other activities to members of the ruling class and the political party. This way, it is believed that the supreme leader is able to gain the loyalty of members of his ruling class, either through helping to feed their indulgences or blackmailing them with pictures and clips of their activities with pleasure squad members. Kim Jong-il was especially famous for his hedonistic activities and tendencies, and according to most reports, he expanded the scope of the pleasure squad in 1994, when he took over the reins of power following his father's death. Some claim that Kim Jong-il actually expanded the pleasure squad to help distract his father from politics, thus helping him consolidate power in his father's later years. Still, no one really knows for sure. What we do know, however, is that he was the one who made the practice and activities of this squad more prominent. Although there were reports that Kim Jong-un disbanded this squad when he came into power, these reports appear to have been greatly exaggerated. With the Pleasure Squad, the Kim dynasty essentially ensures the loyalty of top party officials. They can incentivize these people to remain loyal to the ruling party, thus guaranteeing their access to these women. At the same time, the government could essentially use these Pleasure Squads to further entrench the culture of corruption that has already eaten so deeply into North Korean society. Now, Yeonmi herself has spoken extensively about these pleasure squads. In an interview on the Jordan Harbinger show back in September 2023, she explained that the women who are involved in these pleasure squads actually come from different provinces in North Korea, and just take a listen to how incredibly detailed the recruitment process can get. Yeah, let, what, what is the pleasure squad? Because I've read about this, and it's a pervy question, so pardon me, but people are curious about this. So pleasure squad is every year the officials have to meet their quota again. It's everything's quota, the order from the party. Every region have to submit a girl who is a virgin and who is pretty and meet the all government's data, like the major high look, all of it, right? And also family backgrounds. So they, each year they collect all the girls from entire country and the, only the ones pretty enough and the good backgrounds and the virgins going to Pyongyang. From there, they they also select giving Kim Jong-un the picture. Like, who do you want this year? So he picks 25 for a year. Each year, he gets only 25. I mean, like, only 25 women girlfriends, like, that's a lot. Yeah, it seems like a lot. Especially for a guy who, like, Kim Jong-un, <laughs> not in great shape, and his father was even worse shape. I mean, these are old dudes. They're probably not, well, I won't go there. But y Yes, and then other girls going to other top officials. Mm -hmm. Then they divide these girls into different groups. Like satisfaction group is a the sex group, the happiness group is a massage group, third group is like healthcare. They give him the like you know other health issues. So all these girls are being trained for that, and their prime age is from from 16 or 17 to 20 to 23. Basically, think of this group as an elite squad, just like other countries draft eligible males to join the army and help to protect their national sovereignty. It would appear that North Korea instead focuses on getting the prettiest girls to join these pleasure squads. Then, they train them to provide specific services. Massages, you name it. The more specialized a lady is, the better her chances of being put in a select squad. Girls as young as 14 can be selected from schools, playgrounds, and other public spaces, then are forced to perform despicable acts for the pleasure of Kim Jong-un, and his party cronies. Want to know what's even more interesting? Yeoman herself was approached to be a part of this pleasure squad. 
She explains this in a clip on her private YouTube channel. And I actually personally been picked by this crew both times, but I wasn't able to go because my family status. So let's say all these people from Pyongyang go to schools in North within North Korea. They visit every classroom and they even go like schoolyards in case they missed anyone that was pretty. Once they find find some pretty potential pretty girls, they the first thing they do is checking family status. The Songbun the you know your political status. They elimin eliminate the girls with the family members who have escaped from North Korea and you know had the relatives who were in South Korea or other countries. So the first step is Songbun status, that family check, background check. And from there I wasn't even able to go. I just dropped it immediately. The story kind of checks out. Yeoman was the daughter of someone who worked at the political party. And because her sister had actually left North Korea before her, it kind of checks out that those who were in charge of picking girls wouldn't want her on the pleasure squad. In this same video, Yeoman goes on to explain the steps that are taken for girls to be chosen as part of the pleasure quads. Once you pass this stage, what they do is your physical exam. Uh, these girls are picked around 16 to 17 in South Korean age. So in America, it can be 14 to 15 years old. It's pretty young. So they take these young girls and go, to go for medical exam. Then they verify if they are virgin or not. So the second step is medical exam. So you pass the second exam that your family status clear and that you are virgin then the last step. That is more thorough, thorough like head me medical checkup. In that medical checkup, they even see if you got tiny scar in your body. If you even have a scar in your body, you are not eligible to become a pleasure squad member. In that like insanely uh, complicated and difficult process, they pick really this hand handful of women, I mean, I would say it's like girls, really, they are teenager girls from all around North Korea and pick them to go to Pyongyang. When you go to Pyongyang, they have this very intense course of propaganda. They put them in a very single room, each one of them, and give this intense, intense brainwashing and propaganda education. Once that is complete, they assign them to different divisions. It also gets interesting when you consider the fact that the officials who are in charge of selecting these girls literally have no choice. They know that their livelihoods are at stake if they don't meet their quota of girls, so they have an additional incentive to ensure that they select only the choicest and prettiest of young girls to serve the pleasure of ruling party embers. Now that's just diabolical. Adding to this, Yeonmi explained that the parents of most of these girls don't really have much of a choice here. When a government official or a recruiter sees a girl they think will do well in the pleasure squads, she's pretty much hooked. Plus, it's not like her parents can do much about it. Most of North Korea is poor anyway, so parents would almost willingly give their daughters away if they knew that she'd at least be fed and have a chance to live a better life than they did. North Korea being fed is the the biggest privilege you can get in your life. So when these girls go there, they're gonna be fat. So their parents are so happy. I thought you said fat, my Oh, bad. no, no, being fed. Okay. Yeah, they Hence give my... you food. In some cases, these families can also be pressured or slightly compensated to allow their girls to leave home and go serve in these pleasure squads. Whatever it takes to get the girls away from their families and into the hands of the government, these party officials are ready to do so. The training process for these girls can easily take years. They are trained in different talents and also undergo political training and indoctrination. These indoctrinations essentially entrench into the girls that their service to the regime is a source of pride and that they are being patriots by letting members of the ruling party have their way with them. Plus, a lot of these women are taught that Kim Jong-un, with his pot belly, hairline and all, is the most attractive man in the world. So it would be a great honor for them if they could essentially be defiled by the man. 
Boy, talk about serious indoctrination. The training is intense, requiring long hours and extensive work. But at the end of the day, the girls are divided into different groups based on their assigned roles. Eventually, the girls get to perform at pleasure squad parties. These parties reportedly hold twice a week and feature all of the ruling party's high-ranking officials. They are held at lavish locations, and in these parties pretty much every form of hedonism and indulgence is allowed. There are vast quantities of food and drinks, and party officials are free to indulge in whatever excesses they choose. Most importantly, the parties include singing and dancing performances provided by members of these respective pleasure squad groups. Then, when it's time to get down to business, the members of the satisfaction groups spring into action, engaging in acts designed to pleasure these party officials. The experience has been described as so harrowing that some girls are required to perform multiple acts with multiple people on a single night. And if they fail to please their guests, they could face severe punishment. Of course, the happiness group will also be on hand to provide body massages to party members. In some cases, members of the satisfaction group can also come down to round things up with an additional pleasure session. It was said that Kim Jong-il was so deliberate in his use of these pleasure squads that he would tell the girls in the satisfaction group to literally seduce party officials and report back on the conversations they had or the secrets they spilled. However, the parties also played a role in Kim's personal life. He was known to have an insatiable appetite for pleasure and he regularly engaged in activities with these women. Now, you might be wondering to yourself, what happens to these girls after their time with the pleasure squad is done? I mean, from all indications, the government is especially focused on finding the prettiest and most attractive women to serve in these squads. So, when the girls get to a certain age, it only makes sense that they no longer become desirable and are let go. Well, while you might think that the girls would be allowed to return to their families and at least try to rebuild their lives or re-enter society, Yeonmi explains that this isn't always the case. So this, this squad of, of girls, they're young and then they end up doing this for until they're of marriage age or something? Yeah, and then they just go back home? No, because they have seen too much. So the regime, they, they are like, when they take your daughter, it's like you gave it to your nation. So don't ever look them back. So these girls don't ever reach out to their parents ever again in their lifetime. So when you take these girls and then when they, like what we say, graduate, then they match them with the, the guards who guard Kim Jong-un, guard the top elites, guard people. Those guards also see a lot. Ah. So they are forever sealed from the public. Oh, and then they marry, the, the regime make them marry each other. Ah, oh, what a miserable existence. Yeah, you don't even choose your partner, just give you the, like, is, you know, just being chosen and then you get grouped and marry and then forever you cannot talk about what you have seen and did. Yeah, and you're never going to, I mean, you can never, so you never see your family again. Never. You don't even hear back from them ever again. That said, there have been reports of women who were allowed to go back into society after serving in these pleasure squads. But, as you can imagine, it never goes so easily. For one, these women probably haven't heard from their families in years, so they don't even know where to start with regard to rebuilding their lives. At the same time, they also suffer a lot of stigma and ostracization as a result of people's perception of them. And all of this, while still being unable to speak about the things they saw in their time serving at the pleasure of party officials, can really take a toll on their mental health. Many of these defectors end up struggling with the guilt and shame that lingers with them due to their work in these pleasure squads. And even if they are among the few lucky ones who manage to leave North Korea entirely, they often find it difficult to reintegrate into their new societies and struggle with the memories of their past lives. Two Sides of a Country In general, the existence of these pleasure squads is really just a mirror of what society must be like in North Korea. To start with, the fact that these girls are selected at the whims of party officials and taken from their families, oftentimes through sheer force, just shows how much control the central government has over the lives of everyday people. At the same time, the fact that these girls are used as political pawns once again shows the lengths to which Kim and his predecessors have gone to ensure the loyalty of top party officials. 
These men are literally unable to do anything of their free will because it's pretty evident that anything they do or say against the ruling party will only come back to bite them. If they want to maintain their positions, they need to indulge in these pleasure squad parties, which means having their secrets in the hands of the ruling party. The training that these girls are subjected to is also a proper representation of the level of propaganda and indoctrination that the North Korean government applies in a bid to control its people. Remember, this is a country where even access to the internet is prohibited. People can't watch movies or enjoy TV shows, so they literally have little to no idea of what life is like outside the borders of their country. So, the girls are easily indoctrinated and made to believe that their lives should revolve around their supreme leader. And they are made to believe that by offering their bodies to members of the ruling party, they are performing a patriotic duty. Finally, we should also mention the stark contrast between ruling party officials in North Korea and the everyday people. Like I said earlier, these pleasure squad parties are held in lavish locations where all the food and drinks these party officials could ever want are available. On the flip side, the people of North Korea are forced to live their lives in poverty and hunger. If they try to make livelihoods for themselves or engage in activities to improve their quality of life, the government cracks down on them, sending them to life behind bars on some trumped-up charge or another. There literally is no winning for the common people of North Korea. But for the government officials and ruling party cronies, life is as rosy and as dandy as you would imagine. Even the girls who do get the chance to leave their country and try to make new lives for themselves are unable to, as they suffer from all forms of torment, whether due to the psychological damage that was done to them during their time in the pleasure squads, or from the many threats to their lives that the government sends their way from time to time. To be fair, it's not like everyone is taking this lightly. In fact, the international community has strongly condemned the activities of the North Korean government and its use of things like its pleasure squads to control party members and the people by extension. And there have been calls for increased pressure on the government to mend its ways and cease its cycle of human rights abuses. However, North Korea's unique geopolitical location presents significant challenges to addressing these issues. For one, the country has always taken pride in its isolation, focusing instead on being as self-sufficient as possible. This way, North Korea has essentially insulated itself from any pressure from the international community. And instead of fearing things like sanctions and any further action, the government can pretty much continue with its atrocities. We should also mention the country's nuclear weapons program. For years now, North Korea has been building its nuclear arsenal with the hope that any threats from foreign countries or influences can easily be countered. When you've got a leader as erratic as Kim Jong-un as an opposition, you'd best put your best foot forward or he could fire a nuke or something. With all of this, the international community has found it rather difficult to exert meaningful pressure on North Korea without risking an escalation of tensions with the country. And as we all know, any escalations could have significant ramifications for the peace and stability of the entire Korean peninsula. So far, the best that the international community can do is to enforce sanctions and other actions that can hopefully reduce North Korea's military and economic might. This way, the government can essentially be hamstrung and forced to come to the bargaining table. The goal is that one day, North Korea can be liberated, and young girls don't have to live in fear of growing up as pleasure slaves to the men in power. Until then, the work continues. The revelation of North Korea's pleasure squads is definitely one that paints a harrowing picture of what life must be like in this country. It tells us the lengths to which the government will go in order to maintain its hold on power, as well as the level of exploitation and oppression that citizens also have to face on a daily basis. What do you think, though? Is there any hope that this cycle of abuse will stop one day? Let us know in the comments.